In Elizabeth City, North Carolina today, the family of yet another black man shot and killed by police came out to demand transparency and accountability. County Sheriff's deputy shot Andrew Brown Jr. five times last week while executing a warrant. And today, attorneys for Brown's family said an independent autopsy shows Brown had turned away from deputies and was preparing to drive off when they fired the fatal shot. Now, you all know from the death certificate that it was a penetrating gunshot wound to the head. But attorney sellers, what they did not know was that it was a kill shot to the back of the head. To my pops, man. Yesterday, I said he was executed. This autopsy report showed me that was correct. It's obvious he was trying to get away. It's obvious. And they're going to shoot him in the back of the head. The FBI is now investigating the shooting for civil rights violations, and Brown's family is pushing for police to release all dash cam, body cam, and surveillance video of the encounter. The shooting came just a day after a Minneapolis jury found Derek Chauvin guilty on all three charges for killing George Floyd last May. And as one of the Browns family's attorneys, Bakari Sellers, pointed out yesterday, this is only one of several high-profile police killings we've seen in just the past few weeks alone. Only in this country can you have the trial of Derek Chauvin be interrupted by the death of Dante Wright, be interrupted by the death of Adam Toledo, be interrupted by the death of Micaiah Bryant, and now we find ourselves here in Elizabeth City. So while many have hoped Chauvin's conviction would move the needle of justice, a large number of doubters remain. Joined now by former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick. Governor, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining good to me. See you, Jim. I don't know what I think about being Where brought we... on right after you described doubters, but uh, I get the point. <laughs> Well, we'll find out where you are in this. Where were you, for starters, when the Chauvin verdict came down? And what was your immediate reaction? I was at home here in Western Massachusetts. I had an appointment, um, you know, one of these Zoom things uh, at, uh, at around, that, around the time. And I was going to do my best uh, to keep that appointment and collect the news when the news was news. But as we got closer, my anxiety level went up. Jim, not because I didn't believe what I had seen, not because millions of Americans and millions around the world didn't know what we saw, but because more than once, juries and others have looked the other way. And so I was hopeful because, as lawyers say, the evidence had come in well, um, and I thought it was important that the case was uh, presented in such a strong way, but also anxious. Um, so I canceled my appointment and I stared at the TV through all the repetition while we were waiting for uh, the verdict. And remember, it was 10 minutes. The jury was in. The judge read the verdict, took the, uh, 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 the census of the, of the jury, and it, was, and it was done. And I exhaled. And you've heard a lot of people say just that, I'm sure. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned your anxiety because I, for one, was convinced the jury was going to convict on the least a serious of the charges, acquit on the other two. And I was sort of embarrassed when the verdicts came down to think that, as you were mentioning, we just witnessed maybe a thousand times, sadly, in the last year, a man tortured and executed right in front of our eyes. And mm -hmm. so many of us had that anxiety. And people like me were convinced the anxiety was, was merited, that we weren't going to get even an ounce of accountability. So are we making too much of those three convictions when there really shouldn't have been any other possible outcome? Well, first of all, the, the trial by jury um, and the system presumes that um, we don't know the outcome until we have the outcome. Um, this was different in the sense that uh, that we all saw it. And um, uh, but the defense often made in cases of this kind, including cases of this kind that I've been involved in, is that so much more happens outside the uh, uh, the sight of any videotape or eyewitness. Um, one of the things I think that we're all 
coming to terms with, some of us, as I said, have experienced it um, professionally, um, is that the discrepancy between what is in the official report of what happened and what is demonstrated to have happened in the uh, in the video uh, record is often wide. And it happens again and again and again. So when I hear uh, calls uh, in the clip you just uh, played around transparency, I think, you know, it's tough because, frankly, the, the police departments all over the country have earned the skepticism that, uh, that they have. And until uh, that's... Uh, until trust in their own reports is earned back, there has to be transparency and there are going to be continued calls for it. Here's a part of your statement you issued that day. Does the life of a black man in America matter? A Minnesota jury today said, yes, thank you, jury. Thank God for the world, the nation, and for me, this verdict affirms the dignity of all of us, but it cannot bring George Floyd back to his family and friends or answer for the needless loss of so many others. I'm thinking them of them all tonight. I saw that as a pretty optimistic uh, reaction. Uh, uh, I didn't feel that optimistic. Why do you think it, it affirmed the dignity of us all? Because, um, as I was saying earlier, in cases of this kind, so often it doesn't. So often the defense about, you know, what happened or did not happen off camera, so often the, 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 uh, the victim's uh, life history, the fact that he was or, uh, or she was not a perfect person, had some blemish in their life, as if that somehow justifies uh, judge, jury, and executioner right on a, on a uh, city street in the matter of, uh, in this case, a little bit more than nine minutes. And um, I think, no, I didn't feel as if one outcome um, erased the uh, long course of injustice and continuing injustice or closed all the open questions that are still open. Um, but I think it was a start in the same way that I think the fact that so many people of so many different backgrounds took to the streets in peaceful, overwhelmingly peaceful protests mm -hmm. over the course of a year and stayed at it, despite our you know notoriously short attention span in this country, that isn't uh, the promised land, but it's a start. And it's an understanding, I think, we belong to each other. We owe this to each other, um, no matter what uh, our, uh, our race uh, or background is. And we need to deal with the fact that this happens an awful lot, a disproportionate amount, uh, and an unjust amount uh, to black people, particularly black men. A start to what? I mean, Bakari Sellers a few minutes ago mentioned Adam Toledo and Andrew Brown and Dante Wright and Makia Bryant. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the poll that is so disturbing. Nearly half of Republicans in this country think the jury rendered the wrong verdict. Forty six percent of Republicans. So what is it a start towards, Governor? Well, first of all, I think um, I, I understand the temptation to um, evaluate and sort of cut the numbers by party. I don't care about mm. that. Um, what I do care about is that we start to to uh, to deal with um, systems that are broken, training mechanisms that are uh, incomplete. This notion that we can presume the worst uh, of people based on. Uh, their background or their attitude or the neighborhood they uh, they live in, and that any consequence after that is uh, uh, is okay. Um, some of that is just embedded in the way we prepare uh, police to do their their job, and it doesn't take away from acknowledging at the same time, Jim, it is a hard job. I understand that, but we've also made it harder by asking police to do a whole bunch of things we used to have neighborhoods do or social services uh, do and issues around domestic violence, around homelessness, and, and so on, that so easily escalate. Uh, and then in a training regime that doesn't emphasize de-escalation, we've got a lot of work to do at the system level. And then there's a lot of work each of us have to do in our own hearts and behaviors about you know not turning away and actually facing these realities. You know, part of that may be uh, in the province of the Department of Justice. You're a DOJ alum. I'm sure you heard the new Attorney General Merrick Garland last week talking about an investigation into Minneapolis. Yesterday, 
into Louisville police after the killing of Breonna Taylor. Here's a little mm -hmm. bit of Merrick Garland. The challenges we face are deeply woven into our history. They did not arise today or last year. Building trust between community and law enforcement will take time and effort by all of us. All of these steps will be taken with one goal in mind, to ensure that policing policies and practices are constitutional and lawful. How important could those investigations be, Governor? They're enormously important, and I, I, I commend Merrick, uh, Mayor Garland and, uh, and his team uh, and the nominee for uh, the Civil Rights uh, Division um, mm -hmm. for, uh, for their focus on this um, and, their, uh, and the, uh, both the combination of rigor and restraint that they'll bring. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, I know Merrick. I know uh, that he will and, and he will, you know, uh, assure that his team follows the facts, really gets into it and, uh, and, and tries to hear all sides and understand the realities and go from there. That's important. And restraint in the sense of not just trying to, you know, blow up a, uh, a department because there are uh, elements of it that are dysfunctional. Um, and that's a hard balance, but that is the job. And I think Merrick and his team are up to it. While I have you, can we discuss another kind of, I think it's appropriate to call it violence, directed at the right to vote currently in, oh, in some stage in 43 states, most notably in, in Georgia. Uh, do you, how do you, I mean, people I assume know in your former life, you were a general counsel of a couple major corporations, one of them being Coca-Cola, which was relatively silent early on and then finally did uh, criticize the, uh, the law down there. Do you support or do you think they're effective boycotts of companies that are silent in the face of this kind of behavior by our governments? So first of all, I think um, I want to commend the many, many companies and business leaders uh, under the leadership, by the way, um, instigated by uh, uh, a former uh, CEO, a black man, um, uh, Ken Chenault from uh, American Express, mm -hmm. and a current CEO, also a black man, uh, Ken Fra uh, Frazier of Merck, for engaging their colleagues um, and uh, other large and small uh, businesses to, to speak out on this and to make it plain that this was not a partisan issue. This is about democracy itself. And frankly, if you are a serious capitalist uh, and you want a successful economy, then you sure as heck better care about a serious and successful democracy because they are interwoven uh, historically in this uh, uh, in this country. I don't think companies need to have a point of view on every policy uh, issue, but when it gets right to the democracy in this way, uh, I think they should. Now, you asked about a boycott. Here's the truth of, uh, of the way I think business works today. You can call for a boycott or not. What businesses do or don't do is in the public domain. And consumers are making choices around that. Um, it was a it was a thesis or a theory behind uh, the impact investment investment fund that we started at Bain Capital, and that so much of uh, uh, of inclusive capitalism is uh, uh, is about. These are secular trends. So you know, I I think it's going to happen whether there are formal calls for boycotts or not. Would you boycott a company that was silent in the face of such a law? Yes, personally, would I make that choice? Yes, I would. Um, you know, because I have that choice. Um, not everybody does, but I can choose where to spend my money, which products to uh, to uh, uh, to buy, which places um, to be on the whole. Um, but I get it. You know, I've been on the inside too, as you said. Um, and companies don't want to have to deal with um, uh, the sort of social implications of every action they take. Um, but that is not the answer um, to uh, uh, to this situation, um, to say, you know, we just don't speak up. We just don't engage. This is different. And this is an intentional effort to disenfranchise or to compromise the franchise for millions of people, overwhelmingly, who have expressed some interest in voting uh, for a Democrat in the last election. Imagine that. And so we're going to clamp down on that on the strength of the big lie that the election was uh, was stolen when 
you know, after every opportunity to prove that, um, the uh, the Trump campaign failed to do. Governor, in our, our last minute, let me return to something we talked about earlier. When you talk about this being a start, we have all thrown around the term racial reckoning so glibly, particularly since the assassination of George Floyd. Do you believe it is coming in this country or do you just hope it's coming in this country? Well, I've, I, I have hoped it was coming uh, before and by the it. Let me say, I, I, I think it is about the, the, those, those difficult conversations, you know, I, the, 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 and that's, that is a part of the, of the beginning, which is to say we've made enormous progress in this country on a whole host of, uh, of fronts, much of it in my lifetime, Jim. And I think that's one thing that uh, uh, we and others who care about social justice must mm -hmm. acknowledge. It is wrong to say that we are where we were when I was born in the 1950s. We are not. But at the same time, this is about, you know, keeping realities in equipoise. We've got a long way to go. We made a sort of uneasy peace with non-discrimination in law. We've never made our peace in this country with integration, actually living and working and going to school together. Every time someone is intentional about that, they get hauled into court on these, you know, all kinds of claims about so-called reverse discrimination. The, the, the playing field is not even. And if equality and opportunity and fair play are the building blocks for freedom, and if we are about freedom in this country, we have to deal with the fractures in those building blocks. Governor Deval Patrick, it's great to see you as always. Thanks so much for your time. It's good to be with you, Jim. Take care.